book. Oh, this is very cool. I understand there's some yeah. different viewpoints. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, Hi, I'm Gwen Robinson with the FCCT. I'm actually going to pass over right now to Pierre Prakash with ICG. He'll tell you a bit more and then I'll be back. So over to you. Pierre. Oh, by the, should, I should say it looks like, as usual, uh, more people signed up than turned up. There are seats at the front and it looks like now we're past the regular time. So those sitting up the back, if you would like, there are empty seats here. Uh, there's at least um, 12 or more. So please feel free to come up and take those seats. Uh. Thank you, Gwen. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Pierre Prakash. I'm the um, director of Cri International Crisis Group's Asia program. Uh, thank you very much for coming this morning. We actually haven't had um, at Crisis Group an event like this in Bangkok for, for a long time, so it's great to see so many of you here, and we hope to be holding more such events um, about events in Myanmar, but also uh, in other parts of the, of the region um, in the future. Um, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with international crisis groups, so just a few words of introduction. I don't want to eat into the time of the panel. I'll make it quick. Um, we are basically an advocacy-oriented uh, research organization that focuses on conflict prevention and conflict resolution. We have a network of analysts uh, around the world who actually live and work in the countries or the regions um, that they cover. And that means that our methodology is very much uh, driven by field research uh, in the sense that we speak to people, we speak to conflict actors, we speak to civilian populations affected by conflict to civil society to inform our analysis. And the objective is for the, this analysis to then feed into practical, pragmatic, realistic uh, recommendations for conflict actors themselves, also, of course, but also very often the wider international community in order to prevent, uh, resolve, or a lot of the time mitigate the impact of conflict uh, on civilian populations. When it comes to Myanmar, it's a country we've covered extensively for many years, much before the coup, obviously. Uh, but since the coup, we have um, documented the situation on the ground through a series of publications that you can all find on our website, crisisgroup.org. We also left some copies of recent publications uh, on Myanmar um, at the table at the back, on the table at the back. And um, we basically decided to hold this event because we recently published a report, this uh, report that you'll find in the back. Um, which basically, f which is about the TNLA, the Tang National Liberation Army, which is an ethnic armed group that operates in northern Shan state of Myanmar. And it, this report basically explores and documents how the TNLA has consolidated its territorial control and expanded its governments, governance apparatus since the coup. Uh, and this is actually a trend that cuts across to various degrees uh, different armed groups, different regions of the country in, uh, in Myanmar, in the ethnic minority regions. We actually had another report out last year on the Arakan army uh, in Rakhine State where we had similar findings uh, in the post-coup scenario. And so we feel that you know, this growing cloud of ethnic armed groups uh, in different parts of the country is a particularly important aspect of what's going on in Myanmar now and has uh, a wide range of implications, both immediately, but also uh, for the future trajectory of conflict and of national unity, I would say. I'll stop here and hand it back to... Uh, sure. Uh, you, um, we'll have a conversation for about an hour and a half. Uh, first, the panel will speak, and then we'll have a Q&A session. And after that, you're, of course, most welcome to stay for, with us for lunch. It'll be a good opportunity to follow up on the conversation and, and um, get to know each other. Thank you very much, and I'll hand it over to Gwen, who will moderate uh, the panel today. Thank you. Thanks, Pierre. Um, as mentioned, I'm Gwen Robinson, Vice President at the Foreign Correspondents Club, uh, Editor-at-Large of Nikkei Asia. And uh, um, just wanted to say, as Pierre said, uh, 
we're really pleased to see a um, not only a physical event, um, but particularly concerning Myanmar, which is an extremely difficult thing to achieve. And with such a fantastic panel of speakers who have come from, uh, actually some of them have come from far and wide to be here today. Um, so not only because this is a rare physical event, um, but also I think this panel would seem overly ambitious or perhaps even unrealistic uh, at best, uh, even a year ago with its focus on emerging local governance structures in resistance dominated areas of Myanmar. Now, I think this topic that we are addressing today, rebel governance uh, in a changing Myanmar, is both topical and highly relevant uh, and spot on. And it signposts a significant new phase in post-coup dynamics of Myanmar. Not only have alternative governance structures evolved, but the variety of local administration organizations in both ethnic and Burma dominated areas is now being taken seriously or more seriously by international donors, INGOs, and it, it does appear increasingly by governments, at least in terms of who they will turn to, particularly in conflict wracked areas of the country, to discuss uh, things like on the ground needs, uh, from humanitarian aid to support for basic services such as health and education. I think it also highlights a real reality that after nearly three years, the military controls less and less of the country. In other words, that this coup has failed. It has failed to deliver absolute power that the junta so badly wants. It has failed to deliver compliance from the people. And most of all, it's failed to deliver economic control to the SAC. Uh, as mentioned, we, we have an outstanding panel of speakers here. And um, after, as Pierre said, after some discussion and a short presentation on the IEC, we'll take a few questions from the floor. And just a quick reminder, this event is not being live streamed, but it is being videoed uh, and will be posted in coming days on the ICG and FCCT sites, our, our YouTube page. Uh, and as Pierre said, you are kindly invited to stay. There's a big buffet afterwards. Um, so moving on, I'd like to just briefly introduce our excellent panel. To my immediate right is Noor Mayu Mutro, Senior Policy and Technical Advisor to the Karen National Union and Women's League of Burma. Next to her is Thomas Keane, Senior Consultant, Myanmar and Bangladesh for the International Crisis Group and Editor-at-Large of Frontier Myanmar. Next to him is Ying Lao, Executive Director of the Salween Institute for Public Policy and a board member of the Shan Women's Action Network and founder of Burma's Manals Watch. Luckily, we don't have one of those today. And then next to him is Ku Clore, Director General of the Interim Executive Council of Kareni State and Chairperson and Founder of the Kaya State Youth Network and Kene uh, Kareni Humanitarian Network. So I'd really like to start with um, the first victim is Tom. <laughs> uh, Tom, you recently, as we've heard, worked on a report examining how the TNLA, the Tang National Liberation Army, has expanded its control in Northern Shan State and is now delivering services to residents there. It was also an incredible analysis of the evolution of, wha of what was a small and I think overlooked uh, EAO. So perhaps you could give us a sense of what this administration of the TNLA looks like and how it has been received. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Gwen. So yeah, since the coup, the TNLA has significantly expanded its territory, taken territory from both the state and also other ethnic armed groups, particularly the RCSS. Um, and now controls territory across maybe eight or nine townships in northern Shan State. Not necessarily the whole township, but parts of those townships. So it's significant, uh, sizable area in the mountains in northern Shan State. Um, and it's done this by partly by avoiding conflict, so avoiding fighting the military. The TNLA had been fighting the, the Myanmar military for 10 years prior to the coup. Um, and when the coup happened, it was an opportunity to, to dial back the fighting 
the military also didn't want to fight with the TNLA because it had a lot on its hands. So, you know, you wouldn't call it a ceasefire, but there was an understanding on both sides that uh, the situation had changed and they, they weren't necessarily gonna, gonna fight, confront each other. Uh, and as the military sort of pulled back its troops, the TNLA filled the vacuum and was able to push out other ethnic armed groups in Northern Shan State, mainly the RCSS. Um, so there have been clashes recently um, in Northern Shan State between the TNLA and the military, but the TNLA is now in a, in a very powerful position. Um, and certainly the, the mountainous areas that it has a firm grip on, it's gonna be very hard for the military to, to get the TNLA out of those areas, particularly as they are Ta'ang, you know, overwhelmingly um, Ta'ang residents in those areas. Um, so the combination of territorial expansion and stability enabled the TNLA to, to strengthen its administration. Um, previously it had tried to, to roll out a, a sort of self-government system, but when you're fighting a war, that's extremely difficult. Um, but because of the stability that the coup brought to, to, to Ang areas, it was able to do this more effectively. Um, and the, the administration sits under its political wing, the PSLF. Uh, there's uh, 11 or 12 departments. It's quite a sizable um, bureaucracy uh, covering health, justice, information, and so on. And it's benefited from CDM. So a lot of uh, government workers join CDM, some in Ta'ang areas already, some in other parts of the country, and they, uh, you know, they fled to, to safety in TNLA areas, and they've been integrated into this bureaucracy. Um, one feature of the system that I'd like to draw attention to is the role of CSOs. So like most um, ethnic groups, uh, there's a strong Ta'ang civil society network. Um, and it's, I find it interesting because they have uh, quite a high degree of influence over the TNLA. Um, they have a shared history of emerging on the Thai Myanmar border and they've both the TNLA leadership to some extent and the CSOs have uh, attended um, trainings and workshops, this is two decades ago, um, on things like human rights, um, you know, women's empowerment, uh, women's groups uh, are really strong uh, in the Ta'ang civil society community. Um, so uh, the CSOs now are running an education system that's, that's really quite large, we're talking hundreds of schools. Um, and the TNLA has, has, uh, has let them do that, but it needs them, actually. It needs them to do that. It can't do it to uh, run that school network itself. Um, many Ta'ang welcome, you know, the TNLA administration. Ta'ang areas were traditionally neglected by the state. And so they welcome the services, but they also welcome what they see as the protection that the TNLA brings, both from the military and from other armed actors in Northern Shan State. But there are other aspects of TNLA administration that are less popular, even with Ta'ang people, particularly recruitment. So there's a conscription policy and the expansion of the administration system has enabled the TNLA to strengthen its recruitment process because it now controls more villages. In the past, it was easier for Ta'ang people to evade uh, conscription by moving to state controlled areas, um, but that's become more difficult now. So, you know, on the one hand, welcomed in, in a lot of ways, but also there are tensions over things like conscription and taxation as well. Um, but the TNLA is viewed very differently by other ethnic communities in Northern Shan State. And this is one of the biggest conflict risks that arises from its expansion, particularly the Shan and Kachin communities, um, you know, feel threatened by TNLA expansion. Um, and there are some aspects of how the TNLA has expanded that have aggravated those tensions. So flying flags, TNLA flags in mixed villages, um, you know, erecting stone markers as a sign of, of sort of TNLA control over an area where it might be mixed control. Um, and just in general, an expansion of Ta'ang people because other communities know that if uh, Ta'ang people move into areas that uh, say were predominantly Kachin or Shan, then the TNLA is likely to follow that, uh, that movement of people. So as um, uh, Pierre said, um, I suppose this briefing was sort of the inspiration for this event, but this is definitely not a report launch at all. We really wanted to broaden it because it's part of a bigger trend. 
Um, and although we're focusing mainly on what's happening in ethnic minority areas of the country, um, of course, this phenomenon is happening all over the country, as Gwen said, um, including in central Myanmar, um, particularly in Sagaing region with the creation of people's administration teams. And I think this all just underlines, you know, why this is such an important topic to be looking at now, uh, because it's clear that state control, military control has shrunk so much um, and that these administrations are uh, to some extent, filling the void or filling the vacuum. Right. Let me leap over to another dimension of um, resistance and resistance administration, Tom. Earlier you looked at the Arakan Army's administration in Rakhine State, uh, which is very distinctive yeah. for various reasons. Mm. Um, there's actually quite a few similarities between the TNLA and AA including how they've managed relations with the military regime. You've highlighted in the report this kind of ambivalent attitude, which um, is possibly the path of least resistance. Um, but what do you think are some of the key differences in terms of how they've built their self-administration and maybe a few words about the, the AA um, structure? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to give the impression that the TNLA is cooperating with the military or that the Arakan Army is necessarily cooperating either. It's sort of, you know, they've identified that the most strategic approach for them is to position themselves um, somewhere in the middle. But, you know, the, the TNLA, for example, um, has been uh, training and equipping PDF forces at the same time, right? Uh, and that's very strategic for them to do that. It, they can push them out, um, create a buffer zone around their territory. Um, so I don't want to give a sense that, that they're cooperating. Um, there's no real um, formal dialogue happening between Naypyidaw and, and either the TNLA or the AA. Um, but yeah, as you said, I mean, the, the AA has taken a similar approach. Um, after uh, a couple of years of very fierce conflict, um, using the coup to build a level of stability through an informal ceasefire with, um, with the military regime uh, that has enabled them to, to expand their territory, roll out services, just do things that are very difficult when you're fighting a war. Um, they now control you know, a significant amount of territory in central and northern Rakhine, mm -hmm. um, structurally similar in the sense that the, you know, their administrative wing is under the, the, the ULA, the political wing. Um, and also, like the TNLA, they have an administration system that kind of echoes or mirrors the Myanmar state system with the general administration department. Um, so like uh, village tract offices, township offices, and so on. But there are a lot of um, interesting differences, I think. In Rakhine, um, many members of the AA bureaucracy are actually employed still by the state. So they've, they've willingly been co-opted into this um, Arakan army bureaucracy. Um, still paid by Naypyidaw, still officially report to Naypyidaw, but actually, for the most part, doing the bidding of the Arakan army. Um, it's only in some areas where the state has completely disappeared that the Arakan army has um, established its uh, the system that is completely under its control. Um, and there are some things that the Arakan army hasn't even tried to do itself, like health, for the most part health, but particularly education. Education is still delivered by Naypyidaw, um, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, why spend a lot of money setting up your own education system when you can just um, effectively co-opt the system that's being funded by your enemy, basically? Um, but they still exert a lot of influence over that education system. So you've got um, the Rakhine anthem being played, you've got Rakhine flags in the schools, but you know the teachers are paid by, by Naypyidaw. I think one of the really important distinctions between Ta'ang areas and Rakhine is that um, Rakhine State was much more integrated into the state and its uh, civil service on the ground is ethnic Rakhine, whereas in Ta'ang areas uh, there was, uh, the state was much weaker and civil servants were often posted from other parts of the country. They might be um, Bama, um, and there just wasn't a lot of Ta'ang people in the civil service. So you couldn't replicate the Arakan army model in, uh, in Ta'ang areas. Um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that means the TNLA doesn't, you know, there wasn't a system in place that it could co-opt or a big pool of civil servants that it could draw on. Um, as I said, it used, um, took advantage of CDM, you know, to acquire capacity and resources. Um, and 
but it's had to focus much more on sort of building its own capacity. So um, opening, for example, a school to train teachers for the, um, the, the TNEC, the education system that's run by CSOs, um, which is things that the Arakan Army hasn't had to focus on. And yeah, so I think the key point really is that each system of rebel governance is unique based on a range of factors. So geography, politics, the culture of the organization that's running it. Um, you know, as I said, like the TNLA is closer to CSOs than the Arakan Army is. And that reflects sort of the political culture and dynamics of, of um, those different communities. So. Thanks, that was a, a brilliantly neat explanation. <laughs> Um, so leaping over to another uh, uh, extremely strong area of, uh, of uh, ethnic uh, uh, governance, I'd like to turn to Noor Mayu. Um, Noor Mayu, many of our participants uh, here will have seen the recent uh, KPSN uh, Karen Peace Support Network report that examined the expansion of KNU territorial control and services in southeastern Myanmar and came up with some really <laughs> impressive and astonishing um, statistics, including, for example, how uh, the number of KNU-run schools has more than doubled since the coup. I think 370 state schools have been taken over by uh, uh, KNU administration. So as a senior advisor to the KNU, perhaps you could give us a sense of what this expansion of control looks like on the ground. What are the key points, especially in the context of the things Tom was saying about, uh, you know, how each area is so individual. Um, so give us a glimpse into KNU administration. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, when we look at the KNU uh, controlled area or the works uh, of KNU, uh, different districts, uh, under KNU administration there are seven districts uh, and uh, different districts will tell you different story. But uh, if you look at it uh, regionally uh, from the um, uh, the, the, the northern part uh, of the KNU district. Uh, so Brigade uh, 1, Brigade 2, uh, Tangu district, the, uh, the Tong district, uh, Nyonglebin district. Uh, the Tong district has, al uh, until the coup, uh, had always been under uh, the state's control, heavily under the state's control. So not very many KNU's uh, activities or uh, service, um, services provided. Uh, but um, with the expansion, as reported in the uh, KPSN report, uh, in those areas, uh, many, and it's also a kind of readily available pathway for uh, people from the cities to, uh, to, to flee or to relocate. Uh, so many people came uh, to the region, came into the, di uh, the Tone district uh, and to the border. So KNU, uh, and uh, those areas uh, have always been under, uh, somewhat uh, KNU also occupied, uh, it's the KNU uh, administrative area, so KNU also, the KNLA also occupied some post, uh, but uh, for the Tone District, it's uh, and heavily under the, the Damodor's uh, control. But uh, after the coup, uh, that changed. Uh, but I, I would say that uh, KNU's uh, expansion of control in those areas, uh, it's uh, it's made uh, more available by the coup, but it was uh, a, a strategic plan prior to uh, the coup, right? Um, because uh, you have to also look at uh, connected with the NCA, the impact of NCA. That's the ceasefire uh, agreement. The ceasefire agreement. Of 2015. Uh, 2015. Uh, and uh, NCA, during the, uh, so KNU signed the NCA and uh, had uh, been able to uh, do uh, more activities uh, without uh, being uh, disturbed uh, by the Damodor. Not necessarily freely, but at the same time, uh, being KNU uh, in the district, uh, in those control areas, KNU had uh, services, uh, uh, services provisions. So to to expand uh, the services provision, uh, KNU expanded uh, also militarily. Uh, so uh, mm. because th there were people already, uh, the, the current people and the uh, civilians already living in the area. So 
I think it's, uh, it's a con uh, we have to look at it in connection. Uh, the ceasefire agreement signed, uh, KNU uh, expanded uh, its activities, uh, especially service provisions, and the coup. So more, uh, uh, like uh, Tom observed, uh, after the coup, uh, more population, population increased. Among the population, uh, there are, pe uh, so um, humanitarian uh, needs, uh, the uh, be, uh, demands uh, get higher. But at the same time, the CDMS came, so that uh, it also uh, added to the the, the labor to, to provide uh, services. So all these things uh, on the ground, uh, uh, for KNU, it's the, their control, originally their control area. But um, with, uh, with the, after the coup, uh, the military, uh, the, the addition of strength, uh, labors coming from all rounds, uh, KNU could continue uh, the, the, the expansion uh, relatively um, Relatively, uh, in in a in a bigger way, mm. uh, but this is this also means for KNU to uh, burden uh, to shoulder the the humanitarian crisis uh, uh, in the regions. Mm. So usually, KNU would provide uh, services for the Korean people, the Korean population, but it's not just the Korean now. Uh, it's the population affected by, uh, population included all ethnicities affected by the coup. So this, uh, the expansion uh, comes uh, with uh, the burden as well as uh, <coughs> the labors, sure. uh, the additional labors uh, because people fled uh, their uh, workplace or hometowns. That's, uh, so for KNU, it's, uh, as always, uh, it's uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, with the advantages, they also face uh, the striking amount of uh, pressures uh, to, to respond to humanitarian crisis, for example. Mm, I see. And um, as with the examples that Tom mentioned earlier, the TNLA in Northern Shan, AA in Rakhine, they also, they actually use ceasefires or lulls in conflict to expand their control. Um, but KNU expansion, as you point out, has occurred in you know a period of, of extreme fighting sometimes and uh, renewed conflict uh, against the, the military regime. Um, so what additional challenges do you think that creates in terms of governance and um, service delivery? Uh, also, you know, the very different needs from local communities. Um, uh, particularly with that pressure to expand, even if you've got a lot of CDMers, as yeah. you said, that's more of a problem sometimes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think uh, the challenges uh, faced uh, probably not very different from other, like for example, uh, in Korean state uh, or other states. Uh, but uh, uh, in Korean area, uh, this is uh, in within Korean state as well as beyond Korean state. Uh, the, because the, uh, after the coup in March uh, uh, 2021, that was the first airstrike uh, against the Koran. Uh, the now, uh, airstrikes are not even news anymore. Uh, I was talking to Gloria and uh, it's not even news anymore and we don't see it a lot uh, and people don't talk about it, the locals uh, don't talk about it. They just uh, take it as uh, this is what Daily they have life. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, the first airstrike was uh, March, uh, in March uh, 2021. Uh, against the K one of the KNU camps, uh, the KNU camps, uh, and uh, if you, the challenges, uh, like I said, uh, usually uh, before KNU services are uh, were confined to uh, the current population, so service providers and the locals, the current, uh, the local currents, uh, cooperations uh, and relationship uh, had been built for uh, for many years. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, but after the coup, it's not just the Korean population, it's men, uh, different, uh, different people. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, a challenge uh, from all fronts, uh, not just uh, on practical ground delivering services, but also politically and socially. And I think uh, 
for KNU, uh, it's uh, because of the experience, the current uh, CSOs, uh, because of years of experience managing the logistic and uh, delivering services to the current areas, not a challenge. It does because every now and then they face this crisis, uh, depending on the war. Uh, but uh, when it comes to uh, different uh, populations coming together, uh, facing the same uh, threat, uh, and you have to, uh, when KNU has to address that, uh, I think uh, the KNU administration, regardless of how sophisticated, sophisticated it has been, right now the, mm. uh, the procedure, uh, everything has to take into consideration uh, of not just Karen. You are responding to the need of the demands from uh, people other than Karen. And, uh, I, and it has, uh, the current, for example, the, the laws, uh, the KNU administration, they, um, they would have, at best, they would have it in Burmese and Korean language. Uh, but uh, usually the, per, uh, the, per, uh, the, administri the administrative officers uh, would be uh, Korean. And many of them, the local officers, do not speak Burmese. Uh, so I think uh, this is where the KNU has to uh, uh, retrain, start from the beginning uh, again uh, to make sure that uh, their officers uh, can respond to population in need, not just current. Uh, so, this, uh, so in terms of administration and the personnel responsible for the, uh, carrying out the, the task, uh, I, uh, that's uh, from the technical point of view, it's also a challenge. But uh, from the population from social point of view, I think it's also a challenge. Uh, you, we can see that on social media. If you go on the ground, uh, meet with the local villagers, uh, you can hear from them uh, that um, initially uh, everyone was sympathetic. Uh, everyone mm. was uh, trying, to be, uh, trying to be understanding. But after a while, uh, it becomes a challenge. Uh, who would receive uh, what, from who, so or organizing all the assistance, uh, even though everyone is in need, everyone in the region is under the same threat uh, and in need, but uh, when, uh, if the responses, uh, deliver, uh, delivery of uh, services are not co well coordinated, uh, it could cause uh, unnecessary problems. And I think KNU has to uh, figure that out uh, from the start, because usually KNU is even though familiar with responding to crisis, but crisis mm. faced by the current people. Right now, KNU is responding beyond the current people, uh, the need uh, and the, the, pe the population uh, yeah. other than current. So uh, that this is, uh, uh, it's a, a practical challenge that KNU face. Uh, mm. While they had been talking politics for a long time, co coexist, coexistence, uh, so on and so forth, uh, but this is uh, what KNU is experiencing, responding to uh, a situation where they have to coexist yeah. uh, and make sure that uh, all the principles that KNU has, uphold, uh, uh, KNU has upheld for a long time, equality, inclusion, all these things, uh, I think on the ground this is the administ administration is facing in uh, right, impact. even as they are escalating conflict mm. and, you know, <laughs> facing mm. I intensified bombing, right? Yeah. This is uh, the particular challenge. Can you just incidentally, don't worry if you don't have that figure, but I think a lot of us are curious about what proportion, I mean, how many uh, outsiders are, uh, are Karen people hosting now in, in their areas? I mean, are we talking about an extra... 25% of population or, or more. It seems like every third person is a CDM or, or a PDF or yeah. something. They're all sort of, you know. Um, uh, I, I, I'm afraid I don't have the, uh, the figure. No. Nobody uh, but, seems uh, to. In the, in the current area, because uh, when we talk about KNU control area, uh, the KNU control area and KNU administrative uh, regions, mm. KNU does not uh, necessarily control, like I said, for example, the Tone District, KNU did not control. It's KNU, one of KNU administrative uh, districts, but uh, KNU did not control. Uh, so 
in the Tong uh, district, for example, many uh, people fled from the cities uh, and they, they would come. So they came into KNU administrative uh, area. And now that uh, the Nebiro administration is effectively uh, falling apart, particularly in those regions, it becomes kind of like uh, 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 <coughs> automatically becomes KNU responsibility to oversee this. Uh, right. So I, I do not have the figure, but in in district like that, in the Tong district and Yang, especially uh, the Tong district and Yang Libyan district, uh, third brigade area. Uh, it's a mixed area, uh, Karen and uh, non Karen mixed areas. Uh, those areas right now are, uh, uh, they have, um, so KNU is, in particularly in those areas, KNU is responding to the humanitarian crisis and population uh, other than Karen, right. in addition to Karen. Yeah, it's clear there's a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks very much, Will. I'm sure there's, um, people wanting to ask questions uh, to follow that up. But uh, for now, I'd like to turn to Ku Clore uh, at the end over there. Um, we're very lucky to have him here from uh, far away. Uh, he's representing the Kareni Interim Executive Council. As most of you may know, the Kareni IEC is a, is a new, almost brand new governing body that has been set up in Kareni State. Um, which is also known as Kaya State. And Ku Clore, uh, who's the Director General, has prepared a presentation to run us through its structure and activities. We thought this might be clearer uh, in slide form. So I think, um, Kuntam, we can show the slides. And uh, I'd like to turn over to you, uh, Ku Clore. Oh, thank you. Uh, first, I would like to say to our uh, I, um, ICG for invite me to share about our green state here and also uh, who are participating here participant would like to request or not you uh, please list our uh, our uh, how to say our target also not only list but also helping us like uh, stand with us where we are trying to to uh, do the uh, demo, uh, federal democracy so to restore the federal democracy. So I would like to request on you. Uh, here, just I would like to share only about the Korean state. Why, what we are doing? Our kinds of thing do we need? Something like that. So it, uh, here, yes. Uh, and for my presentation here, I have only three objectives. Uh, the first, uh, uh, we are strongly reject the military rule, especially we call the mili mili military coup. Yes, uh, so right now we are the first ourselves, we the first our community, so we against the uh, SAC, uh, fight with them. Uh, yeah, they, uh, this is the first uh, objective. Number two is uh, we are trying to be the uh, to assist to, to, uh, to establish our own government in the Green State. This is the second objective. Uh, number three is the, uh, uh, we are yeah, right now we already some of we already found some of the institution like a health department or uh, education department something like that we are trying to build institution a strong institution in the look and eh? we have we try to serve our community yes this and the, uh, this our uh, three objectives Yes, this uh, our, I would like to show in the Green State. In, in Myanmar, we Green State is a very small, it a, a smallest state in Myanmar. Also, a few uh, population we just have only over three hundred and fifty population in our state. But the fighting between SAC is uh, very strong in Myanmar. So I would like to share in here in our state. We border with uh, Thailand. Um, like uh, um, uh, around 200 kilometer um, uh, border with uh, Thailand. We, uh, yes, uh, this uh, uh, border with uh, Thailand, uh, we have a chest, if, uh, yeah, and this is the one thing. Uh, right now you can look like uh, standing in the shell state to the uh, end of the Thailand side. Uh, the main road, most of the main roads are uh, fighting right now. Every day, every day, uh, our uh, resistance arm group and uh, SEC fighting every day. So um, this, um, and this is our green state. Uh, we had uh, um, 
uh, 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 we a relation with the uh, Thailand. We had a good relationship before and also right now. They have us something, yeah. And uh, so uh, this, uh, uh, and here I would like to show the like a San Luis River. Uh, 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 if also the San Luis River, most of area we control the area. Yes. Also the uh, here. Uh, only SAC can control the LIGO township. In, in Green State, we have seven township. Uh, SAC only uh, uh, control can uh, only control the uh, LIGO township, and, and other places also they just they can stay in there apparently. Uh, under rural uh, rural area, we uh, we resist the um, group control that area. So I will share more detail after this. So. Before the coup, our green state is uh, stable. Like a uh, new fighting between KPP and NAC, KPP and militia group also, um, we we are uh, stable. We we are peace. Uh, we also, KM KPP is uh, target with the Tamando ceasefire. We we also are uh, uh, signed uh, the bilateral bilateral uh, in the state level, but uh, the KMPP not signed the SEA. And also the uh, economic situation, we have the, uh, we have the GDP and uh, opportunity growing uh, after uh, starting the 2011 to 2020 in that, uh, that uh, year, we have growing everything like uh, also infrastructure and building, uh, every, uh, every state like a uh, state level, uh, like a uh, uh, village level, village level, township level, every every uh, set uh, we are we that we are they are started uh, how to say uh, uh, improving, and also the like uh, every things are uh, going positive direction. Yeah, also political situation in that time uh, we uh, we had the peace dialogue uh, in state level. And we um, and also. Man, uh, some of the uh, like ethnic party are uh, increased in the election 2000, uh, 2015 also 2020 yeah and also we most of our are uh, we uh, green people are free how to say greater freedom we can go everywhere we can go every time something like that but now Every days are destroyed by the SAC. Yeah, we cannot go to the uh, to everywhere. So. Yeah, after the two year in our green state, we are fighting, helping, kind of having like uh, uh, they use the air strike, uh, also weapon something like that. So we are fight to get. Uh, we are fight strongly in our state, and but uh, how to say that uh, uh, the. <laughs> As a revolution uh, goes on, uh, I mean, they're taking into the uh, uh, longer years and that we resistant, uh, resistant forces uh, and uh, we solidify ourselves and then uh, we develop as a united forces among us. Uh, อ่าจนเราหมาลุเตมุเตตามะนี่แหละอ่าเราทําเป็นแม่ดิอโชเนจิเมซุยอ่าเอ่อจนเราตัวเราอีอภัยสิเตียวเตียนซากาซากาเซ
uh, yeah, here you can see uh, SAC, uh, like uh, most of, uh, they just own, uh, only got, can control in the right goal. In right goal, they ha we have only over three, uh, 30,000 people population under like uh, 250,000 population they have uh, under our uh, IEC control area so yeah so uh, this the roadmap for change to our uh, we call the federal democracy uh, we we are trying to uh, we build a, a federal unit is stay and uh, the, uh, the first thing in our we had a four member uh, we are participating in the um, NUG, also three members in the U NUCC and uh, right now we uh, had already found uh, like a F FSCC um, uh, 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 NUG and uh, IEC, yeah, we already found a commission uh, we are going to work it together this, uh, this that means that we are based in the F FDC and we, we not only uh, uh, how to say it? Uh, we are not only going. We are working together. We are trying together with the energy, uh, uh, especially all the home in Myanmar. Yeah, and this this the uh, our uh, we call the interior arrangement roadmap. We had nice step. Right now we 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 are reached in the like a number uh, seven. We already found the IEC. IEC is the interior arrangement uh, inter executive council, especially we call the government body. Uh, yes, uh, so. Uh, for the roommate, um, uh, we after we uh, we found the IEC, KSCC, we also try to uh, set up the, um, the transitional uh, uh, transitional constitution. So yeah, this uh, this in here I would like to share you, and uh, uh, in where we are uh, we are trying to establish, we are trying to found the uh, government's. Uh, a body, uh, we 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 how to say we, uh, we build with uh, we based on the democratic institution like um uh, um, uh, 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 how to say, um, yeah, uh, uh, kind of like uh, 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 the um the um inclusiveness uh trying to include uh, the inclusiveness in what we are doing. Yes, um. Yeah, in, in here I would like to mute inclusive means uh, not only the ethnic and group, but also the civilian, like also civil society network, you, a uh, woman, something like that. So in in, in the uh, interior arrangement, um, at least twenty percent of women need to participate in every sector, like uh, KNCC, IEC, administration, uh, every level. We 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 write down in the. Uh, in uh, HRA arrangement. So uh, also another one is the you. Most of, right now, most of the uh, leader are you and women. So uh, we we can we can clear share about this here. Yes, thank you. And another one is that this the structure. I think maybe a little how to say uh, uh, not not clear. So uh, this this the stakeholder and uh, this the stakeholder we had a uh, uh, eight. Uh, eight kinds of stakeholder, uh, ethnic agro, uh, CSO, um, uh, CSO strike committee, uh, political party, uh, uh, individual, something like that. We had uh, eight, uh, eight, uh, uh, eight uh, stakeholder. Uh, after two years, we, ha we, we have, a, we have a conference. In that conference, all of that stakeholder are Come together and we at, 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 attend the conference. After the conference, we de we had this declare the interior arrangement. According to the arrangement, we we reform the KSCC. This KSCC um, uh, KSCC role is uh, especially um, uh, make a policy paper, oversight the IEC, uh, lead the political uh, political or something like that. This is the KSCC. After the KSCC. Uh, mm, and after the KSCC, we had three pillars. No? Pillar, uh, the first the judicial body, second is the uh, parliament, parliament body, uh, and third is the uh, government, government body. We call we call the IEC. So uh, right now, in, in under the judicial body, we have we have already found like a uh, uh, three office in the state. Uh, they are Ramni. We they also the uh, how to say. Uh, 
Yeah, implementing like uh, the uh, the the dispute uh, resolution uh, mechanism uh, by uh, addressing and handling the case uh, reported uh, to this uh, body. Yeah. So th also the, uh, this this parliament we just refound the last uh, the, the the last month, so it's very new for us. We will try for the future. Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, here we had we will. Uh, we will, how to say, we will call the Green State Itinerary Parliament, yeah, KSIP, KSIP. So uh, this the uh, uh, IEC, another IEC, we, we, we try to found the 12 departments, uh, like uh, health, education, humanitarian, the uh, defense security, uh, something like that. So right now we already found uh, only uh, uh, the main how to say not 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 the way I mean the um put a year jire thana ngaku go chuno no phai bi dwa yi bo no we have uh, already uh, established the uh, most uh, prioritized uh, department uh the uh which are five uh, departments that we already uh, uh set up uh, uh yes uh and that that five department is the um uh, home affair education health humanitarian uh, planning, finance, and transition. That five department we already found. Uh, so very soon we will we will more found some of the department like uh, women and child, something like that. Yeah. So also the defense and security, we are trying to do like this. So so in here I would like to share about the uh, uh, our government design. Uh, uh, the best of the uh, itinerary arrangement, uh, we 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 found the IEC, and a place of the prime minister. We have seven leadership. We we uh, we have seven percent. We call the collective leadership. But right now, we just already found the six passer percent because uh, one is uh, 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 for one more. We we uh, I think maybe very soon we 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 uh, how to say we we. Found uh, we, uh, he will uh, uh, participate in there. So in in this uh, prime is a place of prime minister. We have seven one a uh, chair, two co chair, three uh, secretary and uh, one finance. Yeah. So th this is our our IEC cabinet member. So in the other under this uh, uh in, in seven member uh, some are uh, attorney and group some are uh, parliament. Some are CSO, something like that, uh, uh, and so uh, here we we can call collective leadership. This a uh, new design for us. We also everything we are trying with a new design. So, yeah, uh, another what is uh, uh, we we try to found a twenty bar man, a uh, small. They not too much uh, in a uh, small department, but we we how to say. Uh, the idea is uh, the uh, the start with uh, the compact structure uh, to provide the services uh, the, uh, the services uh, effectively to the uh, population and people. Uh, yes, and and on the ground right now we are uh, some of the summer township uh, in the uh, village and village level level we already found the uh, like a uh, leader like we call the uh, chair chair and uh, secretary and uh, this uh, when we found that we not just uh, uh, select a leader we we do like a select election election process but not not too much formally uh, yeah we, we do like that uh, uh, this the uh, the uh, how to say Tiba Mel General Administration. Yeah. So uh, uh, here I here would like to share a little bit about the five department. The first the uh, home affair. Um a home uh, home affair we coordinate with the uh, NGG Gogan, take that something like that. And uh, we uh, we right now now we are working together some of the activity uh we uh, yeah. Uh, like this, and under the uh, home affair, we have sub department, uh, four not sub department, immigration, uh, emergency rescue, and GAD, uh, also the uh, uh, police, police, yeah, police. So uh, in that case, or in that case, or four sub department under 
two of the bamboo are very fashionly in the look, uh, in the uh, in the ground. Uh, some some as like a administration and police. We had our uh, our uh, nine police station in the town in the in in the greeny. Yeah, and they also running. Uh, yeah, this no one. Another one is the department of planning finance transition. We we try to. Um, uh, we try. We already found that department. Uh, we start, we have started trying to do their work in the state. Uh, for uh, planning, finance, and taxation, uh, we hopefully to uh, about the income. Uh, three kinds of income. Uh, the why is the taxation? Taxation from the uh, somewhat like a, a business man, a transportation, something like that. And another one is the um, uh, we we are uh, we are working. Collaborate with the NGG, uh, some uh, like uh, um, selling the bonds, something like that. Is the second income income another fine the the third uh, income is that we hopefully from the like uh, international community like uh, NGU NGU NBC something like that. Uh, this income we we are hopefully uh, that that three types of income. And uh, the department has uh, right now we have uh, over 200 staff and 99 clinics also in hospital in the ground. We are running, but we need everything like a uh, sport, like uh, material uh, equipment, uh, uh, staff for um, medicine, something like that. We are need. Yeah, this is the biggest challenge for us. Also, another uh, about the uh, education department, we had over 350,000 um, uh, CDM uh, teacher, and uh, we had uh, 400 over 400 school in the ground, and over 40,000 students in the ground. We are we are trying to serve them. Uh, but right now they also run themselves uh, like uh, uh, most of uh, CDM uh, uh, they lead the school and uh, uh, how to say uh, open the school in the ground yeah so in here also we, we need everything like a sporty yeah so uh, uh, another way is uh, we had three higher education me the nursing university uh, also very soon we will open the medical college. They call it uh, some of the daughter from the overseas. Uh, we lead the, the uh, school and uh, train our granny uh, you. Yeah. Another one is uh, our vocational uh, education institution, like uh, we call social uh, so social science college. Not college, so the social science school in the ground. We uh, they have they are already run it by their set, uh, but we we collab uh, we will collaboration with IC and with them. Uh, we work it together for the future. Yeah. Uh, Departments of humanitarian. This a uh, uh, bigger biggest of uh, the uh, need and challenge for us. On uh, over. Uh, 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 over 150,000 IDB flee to the jungle and stay in the camp, so they cannot do anything like a, or like a, uh, agriculture, like a cultivation, something like that. They can also they need uh, 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 for food day by day, something like that. Also, a uh, uh, hundred uh, hundred thousands of host community, they cannot go to the Tom, uh, so they need everything. Uh, so they we we are we I see humanitarian department try to serve them, to help them. That this the uh, um, department of humanitarian needs. Yeah. Okay, this are uh, my presentation. If it's not clear, you can uh, 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 you can question me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Kukloray. That was uh, actually that was. Um, one of the first clear explanations I've seen of this emerging new structure. So I think that was extremely special to, um, to get that kind of briefing. And we'll come back on, on questions uh, later. So now I'd like to turn to, last but not least, uh, Ying Lao. Um, so we've heard so far about uh, various different models and approaches to governance in Myanmar's border areas, but there are also many examples we haven't touched on, including the KIO, the Kachin Independence Organization, and the WA. Um, as someone who has worked extensively on federalism, how do you see these systems potentially fitting into a future federal uh, Myanmar? And you know, how do you think it would work, given they're so diverse? Um, 
I'll throw that at you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first, I will not be talking about KIO or the WA. Uh, no, I, this is right. not uh, in my area of expertise. Um, and I think uh, the, the people of Kachin State and the people from the WA State should be the ones speaking on, uh, you know, on their own systems. Uh, for me, I, I like to talk about um, the issues of local government. In fact, this is not new. Uh, we have been talking about this uh, for a very long time, but it has never really given a chance to uh, practically, truly emerge. Um, I like to revisit the issues of, um, one is the state constitutions. We have been, uh, the, the, the state constitution drafting process has been uh, ongoing since 2001. And um, we have had seven, eight states, the constitution of eight states. You, you would thought that, wait, is she wrong? Um, no, I'm not wrong. Uh, it's eight states. Uh, there are seven states that we all know of. And then there is a Danindai states. Uh, the, some people from the Nindai region uh, initiated the constitution drafting process and they call their state constitution state constitutions and they call it the Nindai states. So we have the draft of the uh, constitution for eight states. And in all of those states, they have also imagined what kind of uh, governments they want to run in their own state their way of expressing their rights to self-determination. Um, and this is uh, very important. Please allow me to also revisit a little bit of history. Oh, here come history. Now we're also going to start fighting and debating. Um, one really fundamental issue is the, the we, we, we keep saying this, uh, what's that? Um, competing and conflicting mm -hmm. historical narrative, right? right? Um, if you look at, if you listen from the, or if you studied from the dominant historical context, you would think that uh, this union has existed since the beginning of time, and somehow it just happened to be very diverse. Uh, in reality, uh, I believe that most of you know that that is not the case. This union only emerged in 1947. It emerged in 1948 uh, when uh, this particular map uh, gained independence from the British. Then what were they before that? Before that, they were separate. They want a union. They were separate. How they have been separate, living separately, that's uh, one part of the story. But I'm going to talk about the second part, how they came together. They voluntarily joined to, uh, to form this union. That's their way of exercising their rights to uh, their sovereignty. That means uh, even after they joined the union, the sovereignty remained with them. They did not surrender their sovereignty to the union. That is the basis of the claim of self-determination for all these different member states the Shan, the Kachin, the Chin, the Karani, particularly the Karani. This is us always joking to our grand Karani brothers and sisters. You were perfectly independent. Why did you join the union? Why? So they were like, yeah, our leaders not, they weren't really thinking straight maybe at that time. Um, this is us joking uh, amongst uh, each other, but the, the Karani were perfectly independent. They actually joined the union. So this is the basics of all of these self-determinations. And this has been the debate since the, the, the day one of the union. Where did the power come from? How do we do the power sharing? Federalism is all about power sharing. It's not about the union being so generous that it bestows some of its power to the state. It's about the state voluntarily join this union. Without the state, this union would have never existed. Without the sovereignty and the power that the state granted to the union, this union would have never existed. However, the dominant narrative has always been that there has always been the union, and then this state trying to take uh, this union apart, trying to disintegrate the union, 
any calling for the rights to self-determination, the rights to govern our own territory, our own people, our own land, has always been considered as the enemy of the states. And it's time to change that narrative and to reassert our own narrative. That is our right to self-determination. Now, back to your question, Gwen. The, so the debate has always been between the union and the state, and how do we share this power? And has very little uh, been about how do we organize even our own within our own states. That's where the state constitution's uh, drafting process came in. That's where we were um, tasked with exploring all these different uh, models, different uh, 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 design for exercising our own rights to self-determination within the state. That's the local government. Now, there has also been a debate uh, on these two very tiny little terms called government and governance. There was one occasion where somebody fixed my grammar. Every single word I used, government, this person changed it to governance, and that was a long debate. Because I wasn't talking about governance, I was talking about government. While the governance existed before the government actually exists, but most of those governance structures are rarely the creation of the state. It has always been used as the instruments of uh, instruments to assert the dominance of the central government. It has never been about right to self-determination. It's never been about the local communities, never been about the states. It has always been those governance structures that we have had in our countries has always been about the center asserting their dominance over the state. This is uh, why when we are talking about the state constitutions, we need to talk about how the, where those powers of the state come from and how those powers are going to be shared among all those different localities. Mm. Mm. Then, uh, one last point, sorry. One last point is about the function of the, 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 the government, the governance side of things. We're talking about the government as in, within a federal structure, we have the state government, within the state's territories, we have local governments. Those are the structures, the three different uh, uh, levels, layers. Then, when we talk about the governance of things, we're talking about what it is that exactly we want to achieve. Why are we even bothering talking about this? Then the answer is, we really want to allow all these different diverse community mm. uh, to be able to exercise their power, to be able to participate in these political processes. Historically, our country has always been dominate, dominated by the majority, be it uh, ethnic majority or religious majority or even gender majority. Number-wise may not necessarily be majority, power-wise, they has always been the majority. They has always been the dominance. Uh, in case it's not clear, it's the men. Um, so um, this, right, we, we wanted to make sure that this local governments, we were asking about how do we manage these diversities. We don't have to manage the diversities. The diversities will always be there. As long as there is a system, a structures that is fair, for everyone that would allow everyone to be able to participate in this democratic process, this administrative process, I'm sure everyone will be happy. It's about the rule of the game. Mm -hmm. It's never really about the result. But yeah. for our country, the rule has never been fair. The rule has never been clear. The rule has never been truly discussed and considered. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ying Lao. Uh, th that was uh, extremely... Uh, concise and uh, punchy uh, description, but can I just ask you about both timing and form of what you're talking about? Back in May, you wrote an article in Asia Times stressing the importance of not waiting for federalism to emerge from the top. And you were saying 
that it could be built from the bottom up immediately by strengthening local government and local governance institutions. So what can, let's talk about how this process could be accelerated, facilitated, especially also by outsiders who might be supporting that process. And how can it be done in a way that ensures, say, that outsiders supporting this process aren't influencing it in a negative way? Um, you know, you get it. Thank you. Um, this, this, I, I'm really uh, glad you mentioned the article. I kind of forgot about it. Um, the, we, we, like I said, we have been talking about this, and do we really have to wait until we finish debating about this thing? Actually, we don't have to, because uh, you can see that in the Karenni state, as well as in the Karen state, uh, in a very extremely, extremely embarrassing and limited way, also in the Shan territories as well, uh, the local government, uh, the local governance has been uh, happening, ongoing. We, the, they have been providing uh, uh, services um, to the public. Um, so then, how how do we go about doing that? I think different uh, states uh, are in different unique situations, so they are approaching the uh, situation very differently. I would say that for the Karen and Karenni states, I would I really admire because uh, as I try to help uh, build the local government uh, uh, structures uh, in Shan territories, I, I, I'm not saying Shan state, I'm talking about Shan territories, um, I realized one thing. I realized that the Karen and Karenni communities very resilient. I try to identify like what exactly is that make the, the Karen and Karen community very resilient. They are CSO also resilient. Somehow, even though there is some infightings, they manage to work together very well, uh, mm -hmm. especially if compared to the Shan. That's uh, where I came across this one thing. Uh, it's called com community organizing. It's extremely basic. If you look at it, if we're, we're looking at it from the national level policy thinking, regional level policy thinking, and all of a sudden you talk about community organizing. It's extremely basic, it's very basic. But that's where we comes in. I, my institution, Salvin Institute, was requested uh, by some of the Shan's, uh, um, uh, the, one of the Shan state armies, um, to help them train their training officers, uh, officer training school, you know, the uh, train trainees of the officer training schools. Um, and then I try to think about like, how do we train them on administrations? I can't really go and talk about, oh, separation of power and three branches of government and, and you know, all those political science uh, jargons. That won't work because they don't know how to use it, there is no existing structure, there is no reference point. That's where I discovered this community organizing, uh, community development trainings. Because in all those community development trainings, you have all these different components of, components that is necessary for a government. You have a needs assessment, you have to interview the villagers, you have to do the participatory action research, you have to do the, you know, all of this uh, people ownership on all this, any development project, any d problems happening in any single communities. That's where we start, that's mm -hmm. where we begin. That is when I started to think about, this is where we do, this, this is how we build a government from the bottom up. You start from one village after another, and a collections of those villages will become a township. Collections of those township will become a strong state. And the collections of those strong states, then we will achieve a strong union. Mm. Otherwise, we'll never achieve that union we're talking about. And we don't have to wait until this man up there finish debating. Mm. We can actually start from the bottom up. Thank you. I think that partly answers what is my final question before we turn to questions from the floor. I'd just like to ask each panelist a very brief, very briefly, your view, and this is to address a lot of the people who are in this room as well, and all the, um, <coughs> all of us who 
care and follow Myanmar. Given the trends we've discussed today um, and uh, the developments, what do you think are the implications for donors, foreign governments, NGOs, I mean, even media uh, uh, covering all this, um, who might look to support the people of Myanmar? What kind of, say, um, programs, partnerships, support uh, would be relevant and uh, most helpful if initially the aim is to reach people in need, but also maybe help facilitate uh, processes of federalization, democratization, whatever. Um, you know, how should external stakeholders be adapting to the changes we discussed? So maybe Can I'll. I start? Uh, you want to start? Yes. Okay, <laughs> keep it short. This is um, a short one. Because um, I also wanted to mention one other thing. It, this is relevant to your question as well. How you can, how the international community can help, and how you're not helpful. Um, uh, we talk about how to do things, right? The community leadership, the community development, uh, all of this thing. One really important thing to be very mindful of is the idea that you know we cannot go around and preaching federalism and talking about federalism all the time while at the same time investing all the fundings and supports to the extremely centralized structures. And that has always been the case. That has been the case. Um, one in particular, um, one of our brothers mentioned this uh, federal, what's that? Uh, the Federal State Coordinating Body? Council. Council. Commission. Something, commission. commission. Yes, um, Federal State Coordinating commission. commission. This is wrong. It's clearly saying this is wrong. This body is wrong. The, uh, was the objective right? Yes, maybe the objective is right because trying to coordinate between the federal government and the state government. Is this the right body to carry it out? No, absolutely not. National unity government is an executive body. They, their job is to govern, not to write any constitution, not to dictate anyone to do anything. Coordinate, maybe, but they're not the ones sh who should be starting this, but they're doing that. And anyone supporting that process, you're supporting a centralized government. You're not supporting a federal government. You're not supporting a federal system. Um, so this is how not to do it. Now, how to do it? So the how to do part is, I think it's twofold. One is to actually uh, try to spend some time uh, getting to know and getting yourself familiar with all these different uh, state level bodies and local level bodies. That's the very first step. The second step is also to make sure that all those supports, all those fundings get directly to the people who are in need, not through different layers of international agencies and mechanisms and this and that and bombarding the, those uh, you know, local organizations with paperwork. Um, those are not very helpful, even though I'm sure all this uh, organization, including my institution, we appreciate the funding and the support we receive from the international community. We do not really appreciate the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> Neither does Thank anyone, you. actually. <laughs> Thank you. All right, that was uh, that was good. What not to do? Uh, over to you, Tom. Maybe. Oh, or should we go with? Yeah, maybe Kukore. Okay, Kukore. And as we heard, I think Kareni has particular needs of support, uh, particularly outside support. Ah uh, yes, thank you. Uh, um, how to say with this, so we are not too much different with uh, uh, Mayela. But one thing I would like to share here, when we are uh, trying to build the federalist uh, democracy in state, uh, the first thing we need uh, like uh, to build a strongly institution in the Luge. After that, we can go to the federalist system, the federal democracy. Yeah, it's the one, number one. Another another one is uh, right now we are trying to do the administration like a police something like that. If the like a under humanitarian need the international and external uh, community it uh, 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 can have 
as like a, a directly to the look at, uh, we we no need to more focus for the humanitarian needs. We just focus the like a, the first the SAC and uh, administration for the community and uh, or, uh, how to say the first uh, like uh, the first uh, security for the, our community. Is it more uh, we can uh, quickly uh, forward go to the federal emergency idea. So uh, we need. Uh, international community to support like a uh, stand with us uh, uh, like a support the family to directly to the uh, community yes this mic thank you right thank you very much and uh, now to you may you um, just you know how could yeah. the outside community uh, <coughs> in a situation uh, like uh, like this uh, for Burma uh, obviously, the needs are uh, mounting, and uh, it's uh, it's big, uh, right? Biggest understatement. Uh, but uh, uh, two, uh, I would like to uh, point out. One is, uh, of course, obviously, financial support. So, uh, for governments like uh, IEC or, or administration like KNU to carry out uh, to perform a task under this situation, under these circumstances. Uh, it's uh, it's more than they ever imagined, uh, and coordinating the uh, the technical and logistical aspect uh, is one challenge. But financial support is something that uh, readily uh, what international community uh, donor communities uh, could coordinate and uh, ex uh, extend uh, that support. Uh, because if you look at the country, the failure. And the country, the humanitarian crisis in the country, the nationwide, the, the whole country, uh, the burden right now is on uh, th these uh, state governments or state administrations like uh, IEC, uh, KNU, and uh, TNLA. Like uh, these local administrations are shouldering uh, the uh, to respond to uh, the crisis that is in the country. Mm. So I th financial support is a must, uh, I believe, and it's quite obvious. But another is, uh, like Yilong said, and I, uh, I should uh, like to echo that, uh, more of uh, the not to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we, uh, if, you look at, if you look at and read the reports and the analysis uh, of the situation in Myanmar right now, other, uh, there is another challenge that, uh, do, does not receive a lot of attention is the the violence against uh, the gender-based violence and violence against women in the revolutionary area uh, under the control the areas under control of revolutionary uh, forces uh, and we are not even talking about uh, violence committed by the Damador because that's a given and we always know and we have always been against and fighting speaking out uh, against that. But right now, under this situation, in this situation, uh, situation of women, and uh, I think this has to be addressed because if we do not uh, address that, how uh, we are, uh, in Burmese there is a saying called the uh, you are taking care of and addressing, responding to humanitarian crisis, but you, you are also nurturing violators, perpetrators of the crisis. Uh, so I think uh, this has to be balanced out, and when we think of a solution, what to do, how to help, uh, I think we would, it's inevitable, it's kind of headache, but I think we have to, it's inevitable, we have to look at it and address that. And the not to do part is uh, Burma, like all other society, is a patriarchal society, and uh, gender sensitivity is uh, very low to zero. And I, I think uh, international communities can help uh, because probably international communities, uh, we are also facing the same challenges, but at least uh, we are exposed uh, we, uh, in the international community. We are exposed, we have to talk about this, we have to face this, we are mm. being deterred by the laws and mm. uh, whatnot. Uh, so when we are supporting the Burmese or the people of Burma, different communities, we would, I think it would help a lot to take that into consideration and to respond it accordingly so that we are not going to be uh, uh, responding to humanitarian crisis and perpetuating uh, those uh, who cause the crisis. And uh, this is not just, when we talk about gender, 
uh, violence, gender-based violence, it's not, perpetrators are not just uh, the demagogue. Now, perpetrators are, uh, b this is a social problem. So we, I think uh, this is one area that we still need a lot of attention from media because we need to tell the stories for people to know. Uh, and then uh, from uh, research institutions because we need to understand uh, where the problems, uh, the problem is rooted, where it came from, et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, of course, uh, every one of us uh, together trying to find ways uh, ha by having more dialogues, more discussion on this. And you think also financial support. Exactly. Right. Yes. Thank you. And thank you. And finally, uh, last word, Tom. Yeah, mm. Thanks. Um, just very quickly, I think I'm going to be echoing a lot of the points that we've just heard. But um, yeah, I think it's really about, yes, there's the need for financial support. That's clear, I think. But it's about viewing sort of non-state administrations more as potential partners. I still feel that there's a kind of automatic bias in favor of the state and a tendency to see ethnic armed groups in particular uh, negatively as disruptive forces, uh, as spoilers that are undermining the state. But the military through the coup and its response has shown where the main problem in Myanmar lies. Um, so I think we need to move beyond this idea, at least in a Myanmar context, that non-state governments or rebel, rebel governments, as we were talking about them, are somehow less legitimate. They've always been a part of the landscape in Myanmar, but now we're seeing uh, more than ever how important they are, mm. uh, particularly in a, in a conflict context, uh, when, when a country is so conflict effective. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, it won't be necessarily easy to work with these administrations. Uh, as we've been talking about, they're all different. Mm. KNU is, sorry, KNU is very different to the IEC. Uh, it's different again to the TNLA administration. Um, so they're unique. Uh, they require different sort of modalities and different ways of working together. Um, but I think each of them, you know, they do present an opportunity um, to work together. Um, for the betterment of people living in those areas. But it, we can't just expect them to conform to, you know, here's a pot of money, here's the, the, the sort of the paperwork you've got to fill in, here, you know, send us all your receipts, get three quotes, all this kind of thing. <laughs> That's not gonna work. <laughs> Sounds there's, like you've done a bit of that. There's a crisis in Myanmar, and we all need to rise to the challenge, I think. And it works both ways. Mm. Um, and just the last thing, um, uh, similar to what Normayu said, I mean, I think it's really important. The, a lot of these administrations are led by uh, ethnic armed groups, but um, it's really important, I think, to try and strengthen civilian leadership in these contexts. Um, you know, working with ethnic politicians, CSOs, um, and make them as inclusive as possible. Uh, so, you know. Um, ensuring that women are, are playing a leading role. It's one of the great things, I think, about the IEC as well. Um, you saw two out of the six, not quite 50%, but in a Myanmar context, I think that's a, that's a step forward. Um, so, you know, um, not to undermine the leadership of armed groups, but to ensure that they take into account a wide range of perspectives and are right. properly reflecting the diversity of the communities that, that they're representing. Thanks very much. Look, there is a ton of other issues that I'd, we'd like to go into, but we've, we're really out of time. I mean, for example, some of the work Mayu has also been doing on, on putting the focus on um, promoting or giving uh, women more of a participatory role in um, leading. I think this is where uh, EROs and all the ERO structures, uh, like Ying Lao, you pointed out, are uh, falling down a bit. There's a a lot of um, exclusionary, uh, um, exclusionary uh, gender um, issues in all these organisations. But anyway, uh, this is the topic of another, I think, another panel. Um, and now I'd just like to turn it over to the floor. If anyone would like to ask a question, we can take a few. We put off the lunch for another 20 minutes or so. Uh, there's a a uh, delicious buffet up there afterwards. Um, I can see we've got an eager questioner there. Um, Tony, just identify yourself. And uh, Tony Davis, I write for Jane's Defence Publications. This is a question specifically for Tom on the TNLA, and I think it relates very directly to the question of governance. The question is this, 
How does the TNLA relate to the issue of narcotics in Northern Shan State? Because there seems to be a fundamental tension. The TNLA rose, as I'm sure you pointed out in your, in your piece, which I've yet to catch up with, but the TNLA rose on a very hard line counter-narcotics policy, right? Uh, and that this goes back to its fights with the Panse militia, this, that, and the other. So, as far as I'm aware, that policy, hard line counter-narcotics, has been maintained at the local level and is presumably spreading with the spread of governance. On the other hand, the TNLA live and are expanding in the heart of darkness. So, on the Burma Road, Musse, Lashio, Mandalay, they are sitting on one of the main arteries where precursor chemicals are coming into the billion dollar narcotics industry in Shan State. Their closest ally is the UWSA, the WA, who preside over much of the narcotics production in Shan State. So the question is simple. How do they deal with this? And underlying the question is the supposition that TNLA governance is not based on taxation of tea growing in the Shan Hills. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Take one at a time. Uh, yes, that was in the briefing. Um, yeah, no, you're right. It's fundamental. There is a fundamental tension there. Um, but they did uh, um, rise to power, uh, return to to Ang regions through a very strong anti-narcotics campaign. Yet they are positioned in Shan State, which is the center of the methamphetamine, you know, production um, in Asia. Um, and taxation of the highway is one of the main sources of income. I think your observation that their income comes from tea is probably right. I mean, sorry, that it doesn't come from tea is probably right. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I think to own communities as well, um, you know, I mean, they've, a lot of them have been affected by a decade of war before that state neglect. These are not particularly prosperous areas. Um, there's a difference, again, with the Arakan Army where um, Arakan Army is taxing every month um, Rakhine uh, households. Um, but in the TNLA areas, it's not as formalized as that, and I think it's a deliberate strategy not to place too much burden onto Ta'ang communities. Um, so <laughs> how do they manage that? Well, I think it's, uh, it's actually driving some conflict because they look for alternative sources of income as well. There's a limit to um, how much revenue, I think, they can extract from anything that's connected to the drug trade. And this is driving an expansion um, in part. Uh, you know, there's been tensions with the KAO over taxation of gold mines, for example. Um, fighting in uh, around Ceylon, like around Namkam, which seems to be aimed at securing uh, an entry point into China um, for trade, for commerce. Um, so the need to find um, non-drug-related -drug revenues is driving conflict in Northern Shan State with other ethnic armed groups and also with, with the Tamadol, with the military. Um, so that's part of the problem for the TNLA and what they have to try to work through. But um, certainly, you know, being openly involved in the, the drug trade, I, I think as soon as that happens, it would undermine support for the TNLA and to UNC communities. Because one of the, you know, one of the, uh, the, the benefits that to UNC people see as the TNLA has expanded in recent years oh, is, sorry, is um, that they have uh, cracked down on narcotics uh, in Ta'ang areas. Um, that's been one of the things that comes through, like uh, the benefits are often listed as, you know, education, which wasn't always there previously, and anti-drug campaigns in villages. Mm. So they're maintaining that, that hasn't, um, hasn't changed, and it's fundamental to their support, so. Thanks very much. Um, Huye, if you can introduce Sanhui. yourself. Sanhui from The Straits Times. I have uh, two questions for all panelists. So the first is, um, uh, how disruptive are the airstrikes of the SAC uh, to the administrative systems that you just described? And uh, secondly, um, how dependent are these systems, are these administrative systems on external funding? So we know that SAC has imposed uh, banking restrictions, right? How, have, how has that affected these administrative systems? 
Sorry, can you just, just that last bit. You're saying SAC imposed ah. restrictions on banking yeah. and money, financial. Financial, yes. So, so how are those restrictions? Yes, so that's tied to how also how dependent are these systems on external funding. And is that directed to? All panelists. Right, okay. Very briefly, I mean, uh, perhaps start with you, Mayu. As uh, <coughs> the airstrikes, uh, the for, for uh, I, I was just asking Gloria if uh, the battles uh, fighting continues uh, in Korean state because I did not, uh, I have not been following the news for a, a few days, and uh, he said yes, in, uh, it's very, uh, uh, very much heated. And I asked the airstrikes, and then apparently, yes, uh, the airstrikes continue, and it's very uh, ignorant on my part because the current in current state uh, and current state, uh, at least in these two connected areas, geographically connected areas, the airstrikes uh, when. Uh, I came from, uh, I have been to the Korean uh, area, so the airstrikes, when airstrikes uh, happen, um, it um, not only it causes uh, the increase of uh, uh, like uh, IDP, uh, more uh, humanitarian, uh, more population uh, that uh, would need humanitarian uh, assistance, but also uh, to, to re, uh, realign all these, uh, the, the programs, mm. realign the programs, uh, readjust the programs uh, by the CSO and their local administrations. So, uh, and uh, the, uh, for example, the school structure, the uh, health facilities, those have to be, uh, one hospital in the third brigade area, for example, it's a pretty elaborated, uh, providing many sophisticated uh, uh, health uh, uh, support. Uh, but um, because of the airstrikes that constant and uh, it's under constant uh, attack, they have to have like shadow hospital. So it it uh, it disturbs uh, and um, the, the the locals uh, people who come from who come to the hospitals for example <coughs> are from different regions from the town they come to this hospital uh, from Tangu from uh, it's uh, in uh, third brigade area so every region at least on the northern part uh, come to this hospital but because of the airstrikes uh, threat uh, the uh, the hospital has to um, go under hiding hibernation <laughs> kind of and uh, it people uh, come when communication also break down people don't know where to go and then the route uh, because we do not have uh, usually those uh, areas uh, we climbed uh, mountains you know? everywhere we wanted to go we had to climb but uh, only these days uh, recently they had car they started to have uh, car roads but because of airstrikes but car roads are limited because of airstrikes uh, if the transportation the car road got destroyed then it also uh, uh, caused a uh, problems, collateral problems for uh, receiving uh, and transporting uh, patients. So these, and the schools, the schools in Korean State, for example, they had to relocate. And when they relocate, uh, parents, children, the school could relocate, but the students could not uh, go all the times along with the school uh, because the children have to stay with the parents or parents do not want to let the children. So educationally and also health-wise, uh, Every, uh, uh, the, the airstrike, even if it, if it stops and if it is not as frequent as before, still cause uh, instability in the region. Mm. And the instability like that, uh, in turn, has impact on the services uh, provide, uh, the, f uh, the service provision, because service provision had to go with programs, plans, and uh, arrangements, and then when that instability takes place, those arrangements also fall apart. So it's very challenging in that sense. Uh, the, the financial uh, restriction. And I think uh, mm -hmm. if you look at uh, the situation on the ground in the, in the cities right now, uh, if you listen to the people daily, uh, you can see that uh, the restrictions um, has impact, a great impact on the SAC. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, whether it is a good thing, uh, I, I think uh, we have to look uh, critically into that. We have to look carefully before we can say it's a good thing because uh, every time SAC feels uh, pressures, the immediate response goes to the people. 
the ordinary people. The immediate response goes there. Uh, but uh, long term, so we have to wait that for long term, short term. Uh, but uh, it does have impact on SAC. You can see that how they restrict people's ability to have to withdraw money, to have uh, transactions, uh, private transactions. Uh, right now, the, uh, the 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 people who work uh, abroad, uh, the ordinary people who work abroad, uh, how their families are being pressured to report. Uh, their income, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think uh, if you look at that, uh, just uh, the life of the ordinary people on the ground, uh, apparently the restrictions uh, have uh, impact. The financial restrictions have impact on the SAC. Uh, uh, on the uh, administration, uh, the, the the ethnic and the local administrations, uh, the governance, uh, that uh, the impact will have the same. But I think, uh, I, I do not have any figures, uh, but uh, people who do research on the local governance, they know better, and especially if they work with uh, service provision, I think uh, that impact is felt too. Right, um, thank you, that was a good rundown. Um, Kukla Ray, uh, also with Kareni, I'm sure you could say something about impact of airstrikes. Uh, also, I think, also, we, was that the sense of your question on the financial restrictions? Also, I suppose how it's impacting overall, like you know, running a um, a state administration or ERO administration. So. Ah uh, yes. Uh, for our green state, we have. Uh, we, right now, we are trying to do two win. Our uh, one way is. Uh, Yes, uh, sure, we cannot withdraw the money like uh, in the town, so we use the un other way. So uh, uh, here I would like to not mention about that that way. Another way is uh, right now we are trying to use the Thai back, uh, s like a uh, Mese, border with the Thailand, no one uh, not use the Myanmar, they use the Thai bus. Also uh, for the whole town, uh, for the whole uh, state, for the future, I th uh, we will try to use the or uh, time back in this period for the future, I'm not sure. But right now we do like this, this mm. kind of two way, yeah. Mm. So I felt that uh, for our administration is very much, uh, f f it's very difficult for us to, to, to about, the, about the financial support, yeah. Right, and uh, also on airstrikes, I think yeah. you have <laughs> the highest displacement rate of, uh, yeah. of any state, really. Oh, yes, and uh, I think not uh, too much, uh, much as, uh, uh, the same with the current, but, but uh, also right now, um, of we green is also we IEC prepare like a, a early warning system. Uh, with some we we are right now going the like a some more pilot project with for the especially for the uh, s school and uh, some of the camp. Uh, if the airstrike come, uh, we we make a, like a. An early when it's uh, something like that. Uh, also, uh, we how to say, Luturigo, the Jaboko Jiri, will not be a do night. I the way she had the machine, so I buy a general of Yai, I'll be more to do a bag of a in Yara. Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the providing the early warning is the one thing, and the second thing is uh, the, uh, to uh, encouraging uh, the, the local population to dig by themselves uh, the, 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 the hiding hole or the, 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 the bone shelter or the, the airstrike shelter by themselves. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I like to talk about the financial situation. Um, for the financial situation, I would say two things. One is uh, during the five years leading the coup, the NLD government has done a very good job as restricting those you know, financial transactions. Uh, for that, uh, the many uh, political organizations, CSO, um, have uh, to resort to very other creative ways to get around all those uh, restrictions imposed by the NLD government. Um, so when the coup happened and when the COVID coup happened, those restrictions are not necessarily new uh, per se. Obviously, it's more dangerous than before to, to have uh, you know, lots of suspicious transactions and things like that. 
but because of the existing uh, restriction that has existed before, um, the, this kind of organizations have been very resilient and have been creative in making sure that they are able to access their fund, they are able to uh, disperse those fundings to the local communities and local organizations. Uh, now, in, the, in terms of the questions of this local governments, whether they, are, yes, they are very dependent on the, 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 the external help in, in, in many ways. Uh, you can see that uh, the people of Burma, in uh, generally speaking, are very resilient and very resourceful. But at the same time, there is always limit to those uh, resources available within the country. So right now, uh, they still need to heavily rely on the external health. Um, this is the reason why we have uh, consistently calling for, uh, at least uh, in terms of humanitarian support, two things. One, uh, the cross-border assistance, uh, th that the humanitarian aids don't go through the military, but actually go across the border and go directly to the uh, service providers. That's number one. Number two is uh, particularly, I think, to the Thai, Thailand, the Thai government, uh, to also establish a humanitarian corridor to allow this kind of humanitarian assistance to go into those uh, areas that are in need. Um, quickly uh, and effectively. Um, these are some of the things that we have been doing. So if by looking at these activities and these calls, you can see that the communities are heavily relying on the external help. Um, that pretty much right. what I want to say. Thank you. Um, succinctly summed up, <laughs> as usual. Uh, and on that note, unless there is anyone with a burning question or unless any of you panelists have something burning. Oh, Tom, I didn't ask you, do you have a view on this financial? Oh, no, that's okay. I've spoken okay. enough, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no, I just think it was, a, it was a brilliant panel, a long overdue discussion, really great spread of, um, of views that really balanced out and I think gave a really rare uh, picture to all of us here today. Um, so I'd really like to thank uh, the panelists for, for coming and for giving us such uh, insights, but also ICG for, um, you know, for actually initiating and uh, driving this uh, event, and particularly Marguerite there. Um, thank you so much for all the work you put into this, and uh, uh, also to all of you for coming, and hope you will stick around. Pierre, do you want to say anything or um, no? All right. Well. Look, uh, with that, uh, we'd just like to invite you to um, uh, have a bite before you go. I'm sure the panellists will be lurking around, so don't let them get indigestion. Let them eat something. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, the video uh, should be uh, on ICG's website and our uh, YouTube page in coming days, weeks, next week. <laughs>